There has been uh, a wide variety of age groups which have been subjected to over the years for a variety of different pathologies. An operation involving the resection and replacement of the uh, thoracoabdominal aorta, treatment of thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysms uh, and dissections. And what we set out to do was to look at the, uh, the younger age group, age 50 or, uh, or less, and see how they did as a whole as a group and then compared those to uh, an older age group of a, a fairly large cohort uh, to, to, see, to, to accumulate data uh, to establish some, uh, uh, some baseline thresholds for which uh, other things can be compared against later. Well, interestingly, the findings were, uh, were really not surprising. Uh, basically, what we found was when we do thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm surgery, it's uh, in this younger age group, primarily patients who have suffered a previous dissection, either DeBakey 1 or a DeBakey 3, many of which with the DeBakey 1s having had a proximal uh, aortic operation. And then there's uh, another group of patients that develop thoracoabdominal aneurysms in a younger age group, and they're primarily those with known connective tissue disorders. Uh, these include patients with Marfan syndrome, uh, Lois Dietz, Ehlers-Danlos sy syndrome, etc. If you look at the GenTAC registry, there's a feeling that even if you don't have a known genetic disorder and you develop uh, aortic pathology and you are under age 50, you probably have a built-in unrecognized or unlabeled a genetic predisposition to aortic pathology. So that's, that's how we came up with the, uh, the 50 uh, or less. It's no surprise that the patients that are under age 50 are, are in generally better health than the older patients. They have less coronary disease, less hypertension, less stroke, better renal function, et cetera. And as a whole, with regards to operative risk on, these, on this group of patients, and we looked at 445 in this younger age group and compared that to over 2,900 in the older age group, we found that no surprise, patients that uh, were younger uh, did better. Uh, we developed an adverse event uh, uh, variable, which included such things as uh, operative mortality, uh, stroke, uh, spinal cord deficits, and uh, the need for uh, a renal hemodialysis at the time of discharge. And in the younger age group, that the, uh, by and large, uh, they, they, they did better with regards to both the adverse events and or breaking down into the, uh, uh, the components of that, the, uh, the morbidity associated with stroke and paraplegia and renal failure. Uh, uh, across the board, they've just, they've just done better. We looked at long-term survival, again, uh, uh, no, no difference with the, uh, uh, a significant difference rather with the long-term survival of the younger patients versus the older patients. Again, no surprise there. We broke the younger cohort down and looked and separated out those with and without known connective tissue disorders. And with regards to morbidity, mortality, longevity, um, we found that uh, uh, there was really no difference between those two groups. Again, those two groups both being in the younger uh, age group. Uh, when we looked at durability, interestingly enough, we found that the, uh, the durability of our uh, graphs when we replace the thoracoabdominal aorta in younger patients versus older patients, the, the durability is about the same. It's actually extremely good. I recommend that uh, uh, we can, you know, continue to keep our open skills uh, available because we are going to be faced with the reoperation of failed endographs from time to time that are going to require an open operation. For the time being, in the thoracoabdominal arena, unlike the descending thoracic aorta, if you look at the guidelines, we're still uh, in a phase where endovascular stent grafting is uh, is in clinical trials, as it were. It's not the uh, the standard of care yet. And ultimately, when we have endovascular opportunities in patients. Uh, particularly these younger patients, uh, lower risk patients that do extremely well with open surgery, we, we'd like to provide a, a, a baseline landmark uh, evaluation that you can compare the endovascular uh, studies against. Well, I think the uh, future uh, research in the, in the area of this particular topic uh, are, uh, are a couple of things. One. It's still a, a lot of aortic pathology out there that almost certainly has a genetic basis for it that hasn't quite been fully identified yet. 
And so uh, we and others need to continue to, uh, to look into that because there may be some treatment options for various uh, uh, segments of that particular population which, uh, w which might be helpful, but we've got to identify the genetic uh, problems first. They're not all Marfan patients, they're not all Lowy's Dietz, but there's going to be uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, some investigational genetic opportunities uh, there. And then I think we need to continue to push uh, uh, the endovascular uh, therapies for uh, these patients, both with and without connective tissue disorders. Sure, there's a lot of challenges out there, but there's no question that technology, you know, given the opportunity, given the time, cooperation with physicians uh, uh, in, in industry, we're going to be able to solve most of these problems. But, but it's going to take a while yet. It's, uh, it's complex issues.